My name is Ross Emmett, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty here at Arizona State University, and I'm happy to welcome you to another event in the Perspectives on Economic Liberty series that we host. This event is also co-sponsored by the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, and I'd like to uh, thank Paul Carice and Carol McNamara for their participation both in this event and other events that the uh, center hosts. This is the first of our spring 2020 um, events for the center, but it's not the last one. And if you look on our website, you'll find upcoming talks about city planning and, um, and freedom, uh, African wildlife conservation, and two talks that our speaker today would enjoy about the economic history of the U.S. West. It's a special treat for me to welcome Deirdre McCloskey to ASU today. Were we to think of Deirdre's career as a concerto, the first movement was, as it ought to be, uh, off to a fast start. She won the David Wells Prize in economics at Harvard University in 19, well, I won't tell you the date, um, <laughs> for her dissertation on British iron and steel industry, which challenged the prevailing assumption that the British industry was less entrepreneurial during the 19th century than it's usually thought to be. Her economic history work won her a position at the University of Chicago, where she joined Robert Fogel and Arcadius Cahan in what became one of the most fearsome, and I use that word deliberately, Chicago workshops during the 1970s and 80s. When I interviewed Deirdre uh, just a few years ago about the Chicago Economic History Workshop, she told me that their job each time someone presented was to uncover where the bodies were buried <laughs> in the paper the missing or false assumptions, the missing data, the extraneous arguments, the unnecessary or overstated claims, et cetera. It was pursued with passion and debate. She also taught applied price theory and developed a well-used textbook with about 1,000 problems to work out that, a standard, that set the standard for Chicago-inspired programs um, around the country. This attention to detail and perhaps the passion of arguments eventually led her to start paying attention to rhetoric, the way we make arguments, which became the second movement of her career. Like any good second movement, it's slower and yet much deeper developing themes that reappear later. The w many of us who have been in the discipline for, well, shall we say a little while, uh, we'll remember the impact of Deirdre's 1983 Journal of Economic Literature article and eventually book entitled simply The Rhetoric of Economics. She argued that economics models failed to convince anyone other than economists, uh, and perhaps not even them, because they don't make good conversation. That is, they aren't good stories. Denying the persuasive power of stories made economics less scientific than it was actually striving to be. The third movement, itself in three parts, began with the effort to combine classical virtue theory, rhetoric, economics, and economic history in an account of why we are rich today, maybe even more than just rich, why we are significantly better off in many different ways. A modern equivalent, one might say, to that combined power of argument in Adam Smith's, uh, and keeping here with, uh, with Deirdre's following, may he of blessed memory be remembered. Smith's theory of moral sentiments, yes, she, yes. <laughs> um, Smith's theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. The second part of that third movement explained why economics could not explain the world around us. Efforts by mercantilists, Ma Marx, Weber, the 1619 Project, institutionalists, see how I slipped that 1619 Project in there? Institutionalists and anyone with merely economic explanations will fail. All that, of course, was the build up to the conclusion, that is, that it was ideas, or we might just call it talk, that changed and enriched the world. Today she joins us to speak about her new book, Why Liberalism Works. How true, it was sitting up here. It was, oh here it is. Ah, somebody's looking at it. Here, come Can on. I hold it for a second? Why true, liberal, why true liberal values produce a freer, more equal, prosperous world for all of us. 
Please join me in welcoming Deirdre McCloskey to ASU. Thank you, dear. Thank you very much. This is available on Amazon.com cheap. Makes an extremely good Christmas present. Uh, Chinese New Year, Hanukkah. This is what you need. Um, in fact, I had a, a very good conversation this Sunday on on uh, on C-SPAN two, um, which will be which is available now. Is that's the way they do it on uh, on their website um, about this book and some of my other books with Peter. What's his name? I can't remember his name, but he did a brilliant job. So he asked me lots of lots of good questions, and I hope I'll get get good questions here. The point of the book is to attempt to get we, us to stop thinking of liberalism the way we think about it in, in American politics. It's in, in North America, or in the United States in particular, the word liberalism has been turned into an alternative word for the left wing of the Democratic Party into the uh, um, democratic s s socialism of, of uh, Bernie Sanders, for example. Um, and Bernie's a nice, nice fellow and all that. He and I were undergraduates at the same time. He was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago in 1960. I was an undergraduate at Harvard College. We didn't know each other. But I'm quite sure that in 1960, we had the same opinions. We were both socialists, and we're, we're going to overthrow this terrible capitalism. That's what we believed. Since then, I've learned stuff Bernie hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> he has exactly the same opinions now that he had in 1960. Uh, 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 um, He's a charming man. Uh, but I would prefer that um, he stay in Vermont. Uh, so th that's how the word is used in North America. The way it's used in South America is also the opposite of real liberalism. I was just in, in Brazil. And uh, liberalism in Latin America means roughly um, mild fascism with an army behind it. Uh, it means uh, that the state should uh, be very active and large and should oppress the population every chance it gets in favor of uh, the elite, the, the, the oligarchs. So in Latin America, it's um, uh, crony capitalism or capitalism in aid of of the rich. Neither of these is what the word does mean elsewhere and has meant historically. It, the word, of course, comes from the Latin word liber, which among the Romans meant f free, free as against enslaved. And that was very much in the mind of Romans, because th this was a, Rome was a slave society. And it was crucial and central that you were either a free person or a slave. So the theory of liberalism, which very surprisingly develops in Europe in the 18th century, in the 1700s, is the theory of a society in which no one's a slave. Now, Agricultural society, from which our ancestors all come, is naturally hierarchical. It's natural to have masters and slaves. It's natural for men to dominate uh, uh, women. It's natural for the king to dominate the population. There's a wonderful, I think, hilarious passage in the Hebrew Bible in the, in, in, in the book of Samuel, where the Israelites come to Samuel and say, we want a king like the other countries do, the other nations around us. 
And um, Samuel says, okay, and he goes to God and he talks to God. It's like a, it's like a Jewish joke, as much of the Old Testament is. Um, and, and, and God says, look, okay, tell them that if they get a king, the king will take their sons and daughters as, uh, as servants and soldiers. The king will take, uh, you know, 10% of their uh, crop and, and it'll be the best part of the crop. And, 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 the, and God tells Samuel, Samuel, uh, Samuel to say, look, you got to tell them, don't come whining to me when you find what kings are actually like. And so Samuel t tells the Israelites this, and they say, ah, do we care? We want a king. We want a king. So they get a king. They get Saul. They get King Saul. And there's no complaining to God permitted. And that's the standard situation in an agricultural society. Now look, everyone in this room is an African. Let's get that straight. <laughs> Homo, so, Homo sapiens originated in Africa as it seems all you, you, you humanoid species did. And from that time, 300,000 years ago, until at the earliest, six or 7,000 BCE, we were all hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers are very egalitarian. It's agriculture, especially plant agriculture, that's the problem. Because once you've got a crop, the guy with the sword and the horse can say, so sorry, this is my land now. This, this you gotta pay me rent, and if you don't like that, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna chop your head off. It's a very persuasive argument. If, you, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you don't have to put up with that. You can walk away, since the groups were very small, 20, at most 30, but more like 20. It was very easy to knock off this irritating uh, big man trying to, trying to say, no, that's, that's my spear now, I'm gonna take it. No, no, bang, he's dead. Whereas in agricultural societies, the landlords, the appropriately named, appropriately named landlords, were in cahoots with each other. If your people started to act up and said, no, we're not gonna pay your rent, you could call on your, your cousins, uh, the other landlords, to come with their swords and horses. So there, it's remarkable that there was this change. Because we were still in the 18th century, and even in England and Scotland, agriculturalists mainly. 80% of the American population in 1800 was on farms. Now it's 1% and falling. So with 80% on farms, landlords, especially in, in the old world, in, in, in Europe, were, were powerful. In the Middle Ages, half of national income went to the landlords. Half of the crop, so to speak, went to the guy in the castle. But the idea arose in the 18th century, as Thomas Jefferson put it, that all men and, 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 and women, dear, are created equal. That idea, which Thomas Jefferson, alas, in his actual behavior didn't implement, he was a substantial slave owner, and didn't, on his death, liberate even his own children by Sally Hemings. So I got some problems with Tom. But the idea was by his time a commonplace among advanced intellectuals in England, France, Scotland, and their offshoots, especially the North American colonies. And you have to understand how strange it was. The idea that people were equal in the, in, in the Peasants' Revolt in England in 1380, John Ball, an ex-priest, led the peasants against the lords. And he said, in a, in a sort of nursery rhyme that 
echoed down the centuries. When Eve, when Adam delved, that is dug, and Eve span, that is spun, who then was the gentle man? When Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentle man? For which John Ball was drawn and quartered, particularly unpleasant way to die. So it, it's completely unnatural to agricultural society to have this idea of equality. And that's what liberalism in the correct understanding of the word is. And that's what I say here. That it's about equality. As the blessed Adam Smith said, um, we, he, 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 he thought we should have the liberal, uh, what do you call it? The, the liberal system of equality, liberty, and justice. Now, what he meant by those three, as you can find if you look closely at the text of, uh, of the Wealth of Nations, he meant social equality, the dignity of individuals. Everyone in this room, I regard, and I'm sure everyone here does, as equal to every other. We're not equal in height or uh, beauty or intelligence or, or income or whatever. We're not equal in those things. And that we're not equal is a basis for trade and conversation for that matter. But we're equal in dignity. Adam Smith was an egalitarian of a, of a somewhat profound and radical sort. And, uh, and, and liberty meant, in his thinking, economic uh, liberty. The right to move to another place to work, the right to start a hairdressing salon, which really I desperately need, um, the, 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 the right to enter any profession that you want. There are some alarming tendencies in our country in that last connection of, of, of professions. In 1950, 5% of American occupations required a license from the state, from the government. Now it's 30%. To be an interior decorator in Florida, you need to go to school for a number of years, pass a, a, a state examination, then you get a state license to move furniture around. Uh, hair braiding, which is, as you know, is a big f fashion in the African American uh, community. You need a license. You need to pay off some politician. In particular, you need to be prevented from competing with existing hair braiders. And this is very deep in our, our, our economy now and a very bad sign. And then uh, 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 on justice, the third term, um, equality, liberty, and justice is e equality before the law. So this liberalism as a um, as a famous philosopher at the other Arizona place, uh, the University of Arizona, Schmitz, um, says, at its core is the right to say no. The right to say no. Now, if you're a slave, you don't have the right to say, say no. Uh, you, you, if you say no, you get beaten or killed. If you don't pay the IRS what it wants, and by the way, I'm right now in a, in a dispute with the IRS. It's, I'm, I'm not going to go to jail. It's just a, just a, just a certain confusion. I, I'm going to lose. I, if, if they decide that I need to pay so many tens of thousands of dollars, I've got to pay them or I go to jail. So the, the right to say no for a woman is the right not to be raped say. The right to say no for a, to get down a little not so heated issue. The right to say no to, a, to an offer of uh, uh, in a store. You walk away with no consequences. 
But in central planning socialism, you can't walk away. You're stuck with what the state decides you want or should get. So it's the right to say no. It's the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's, it's as, as Adam Smith again said, the obvious and simple system of natural liberty. Now, the very word liberty in the Middle Ages had an odd twist to it. It meant special privileges. So you'll have the liberty of the, of the city of London, and you'll have the liberty of York or something. And that means you get a special set of rights that she doesn't have and vice versa. So what's, what's peculiar about modern li, 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 liberalism is, as Tom Paine is supposed to have said but didn't, my, my theory is simply that every person should have all, that, that you all should have the same, the same, the same, sorry, it's better, the same liberties that I claim. So again, it's this egalitarianism. Well, so what? Well, for one thing, as a liberal, and in this, in a kind of loose sense, I think most people in the room are, um, it's a good thing that, that people be free in this sense, that they have liberty. There are all kinds of ways of making that argument, that it's good for their psychological development, and that's another point. Another way of describing liberalism of the sort of, uh, of, of Smith and Mary, Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft and John Stuart Mill is the um, is being an adult. Liberalism, in this sense, is the theory of a society of adults. Whereas the other political philosophies are all, to a greater or lesser extent, a theory of us being children. Now, now the reason that that's attractive the reason many young people say, well, we ought to try socialism, as though 1917 or Venezuela had never happened, is that we all come from loving families. I hope we all do. And, and a family is a little socialist community, obviously. From each according to his need, uh, his, from each according to his ability, to each according to her need. That's of course, you don't charge your kids to get lunch. I hope no one here was raised in a family where their mom said, OK, it's $5, dear. Um, go work in the cotton mill to get enough money to have lunch. No, I, I'm glad we don't, don't do that. So it, it stands to reason if you gr grow up not on a farm, not in a small business where as a child you're involved in the in, in the business. You, you come to adolescence not knowing about the economy at all. And so when you find out that there are poor people, you're likely to say, well, let's solve this by opening daddy's wallet. Income appears from daddy in an old-fashioned family. Daddy goes to the office. Mom stays home and is the central planner. Income falls like manna from heaven. Let's make it equal. But of course, and, and that, that works with friends or family. If I buy a pizza for this row of people, and they're my friends, then I say, well, I paid for it. I'm going to eat it all. That destroys our friendship instantly. Among family and friends, people are supposed to be equal. The, the, the premise of the Cinderella story is precisely that she was not being treated as equal in that household with her, with her, uh, her, with, with, with her sisters. It's so, all right. 
That's why people like socialism, but that's why it doesn't work for a large community. For a family of 330 million people, it's not going to work. Uh, St. Paul says, those who do not work should not eat. Well, when I hear that in, my, in a reading in my Episcopal church, I say yes. Uh, the, the word that I greatly prefer to cap from over capitalism is innovism, because that's really the story. If you get nothing else from my talk this afternoon, get the following amazing fact. Since 1800, income per head in countries that have adopted innovism, that have allowed it to work, allowed people to start that hairdressing salon or move to, move to uh, from, from the northeast of Brazil to Rio freely, income per head has increased by a factor of 30 or more, three zero. Think of what that is in percentage terms. To be over precise about it, it's 2,900% increase. So the increase that we're dealing with in the modern world, the larger pie that we're dividing up, is not 100% or 200%, which you might have thought before you came here, but it's almost 3,000%. Indeed, if you allow properly for improved quality of care, I have two artificial hips. Well, that was an experimental procedure 30 years ago. I have a friend whose m mother went through six operations, and they still didn't get it right. Now it's completely routine. If you have, I'm always saying to young people here, if you're going to get arthritis, make sure it's in your hips, because that gets easy to solve. If you include quality improvements like that, it's more like 10,000%. Now, it's hard to believe that. I gave a talk uh, like this to uh, the Department of, of, uh, of Cultural Anthropology at, at the University of Cambridge last year. And a very distinguished anthropologist said, well, you know, I kind of agree with your figure of 30 times, but 3,000 is much too high. And I didn't say, dear, go back to your fourth grade arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> I did, you know, he's a very good guy. I like his work very much, but obviously not of a quantitative uh, turn of mind. But in any case, it's shockingly high, and there's nothing like it in world history. Now the question is why? Why did it happen? Why did the great enrichment happen? And understand, we're not really talking about what's called the Industrial Revolution, classic period of which is sort of 1750 to 1850, in which income per head in a place like England increased perhaps by a factor of two. No, we're talking about this follow-on, this amazing continuation, this crazy increase by a factor of 30. Why? Well, it's not investment. My friends in the banking industry or professors of banking or macroeconomics don't like this at all because they want capital to be the, innovate, the, the uh, spring in the economy. They want investment to be what made us rich. And it sounds kind of plausible. You look around us, this is an expensive room to make. I mean, this wonderful carpet, uh, cheap, I'm cheap, I mean, inexpensive. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, electric lights and so forth. This cost a lot of money to build. You got to have capital to make that happen. Okay, I, I get that. But that's not what caused it. What caused it were the ideas of this building. The ideas behind electric lights, the ideas behind one of the most simple and startling innovations in modern um, building is the dropped ceiling. That's what this is. The dropped ceiling, which you, we've, we, we don't even think about anymore, is very easy to do. I mean, it's not 
it's not rocket science. You don't have to have a new kind of physics to do it. You just have to have some metal straps and hang these things, and then you can get to the plumbing or the electricity or the electronics very easily. Drop ceilings are just organizational, but they're an innovation. A spectacular and important example is um, containerization. 1956, a man named Malcolm McLean, the owner of a um, trucking firm in North Carolina, said, no, wait a second, suppose we make standard steel boxes. Ch cheap steel had been in, in, in invented 80 years before. Make ch cheap corrugated steel boxes so we can pile them on top of each other. They're strong like I-beams. So then we can send these to China and bring stuff back and then send our stuff to China. And and that completely revolutionized the supply chain of transportation in the world. You see them on rail cars, obviously. You see them on trucks. You take them off, you, 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 you put them on a motor truck. Innovations are all around us. There are these organizational ones, but then of course there are electronic ones, electricity, There's innovations in cloth making, innovations in steel, wood. Wood. We think of wood as an old technology, but in order to build this, this may be, it's probably veneer over, um, uh, well, it could, could be all kinds of cheap imitation um, uh, uh, wood, um, but you can't do that unless you have modern band saws. You, the circular saw is first invented. Then when, when you can get steel that's strong enough and cheap enough, you get a band saw. You can cut things very thin. And indeed, to make, uh, um, uh, the, the, to, 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 to make this, you peel logs and so forth. OK. So there's tremendous amounts of innovation. And that's what makes the investment worthwhile. So ask what the cause is. Is it investment? No. The investment is necessary. But so is a labor supply. So is sunlight. So is the existence of li liquid water at normal temperatures. So is the arrow of time. So is the existence of the universe. So is, so is, so is. There are an infinite number of necessary causes of anything you want to name. But the initiating creative cause of this amazing improvement since 1800 or 1900 or 1970, whatever you want to start, is ideas. The alternative on the left, my friends on the left, I told you I was a, I was a socialist and then a Keynesian. Originally, my friends on the left said it's exploitation. The reason we're rich is that we steal from the third world or we steal from the working class. Uh, there's a very popular um, uh, claim that's being made now. R Ross made sly reference to it in his introduction, the, the 1619 Project, which says, in line with Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural, which is you know, a spirit-raising speech. I wish we had politicians as eloquent as Lincoln now. These words are inscribed on the wall in the Lincoln Memorial. In the second inaugural, he said, to put it in dull economic terms, wealth in the United States comes from the labor of slaves, that we're rich because we, or our ancestors, exploited slaves. And that's not so either. It's neither the rights love of saving, necessary though it is, nor is it slavery, unnecessary though it was. How do we know it's unnecessary? Because if slavery were the key to American wealth, why is Britain 
in which slavery was abolished in 1780 in Britain, almost as rich as the United States. Why isn't Brazil, which had slavery until the 1880s, richer than what? Australia, which didn't have slavery. Now this isn't to say that <laughs> slavery was a wonderful, pleasant thing or that the occupation of the land of the Aborigines in Australia or the uh, First Nations in the United States was uh, hunky-dory. But it, it doesn't follow that because there was grave hurt to the uh, to some side, say, South Asians, imperialized by the, first by the French and then by the British, that their hurt doesn't mean the Europeans were helped or the Americans were helped, the non-Native American Americans were helped proportionately. It just doesn't make any sense economically. If I hold up a uh, hold up a bank and I accidentally shoot someone and I hurry out of the bank because I'm afraid to get caught and I get thirty dollars and seventy cents. So I've that's all I get from robbing the bank, I've, but I've killed someone. That person is very badly off. I'm improved by thirty dollars and seventy cents, that's all. So there's no equality between the hurt and the gain. And in fact, it's been shown conclusively that, say, British imperialism, which was among the most successful imperialisms, didn't enrich Britain. It just didn't. You can, I can, we can go into the details if you want, but it just didn't. And you, you can see this very easily. Sweden is as rich as Britain. Sweden didn't have an empire to speak of. It had one colony in North America, which it gave up, and a couple of islands, and that's it. Yet the Swedes got bananas <laughs> for their, their, their breakfast, as well as Britain did with a world-girdling empire. So look, the argument is that it's not saving it's not exploitation. My colleagues in economics, left or right, are deeply misled. It's ideas. It's human creativity. It's new thoughts that you can make a little steel chair. You don't have to make it out of wood. That you can make one of the great ideas of the modern world is the institution we're now in, the modern research university, which was invented in 1810 in the University of Berlin by von Humboldt. Before, universities in Europe were not about research. They were about preparing people for professions. Priests, lawyers, doctors, that was about it. Whereas in, after 1810, universities started to become, the first one in the United States was Johns Hopkins, became research centers uh, in which the students and the faculty worked together to advance knowledge. And that's what we're in right now. And that's one of these new ideas. It's just an idea. It has causes, some of them material, many of them ideational, ideological, and I can go into that. But that doesn't mean it's material. Ideas are ideas are ideas. Now why all these, this explosion of ingenuity after 1800? What's going on here? Suddenly you have electricity and, and and it reinforced concrete. Concrete is an old um, Roman technology. 
They had it in, in China, too. But reinforced concrete puts steel, often <laughs> under tension, into uh, the concrete. And suddenly, it's not just concrete. It's a skyscraper. My building, uh, built in 1912 as a, as, a, uh, as a printing plant, is 13 stories tall. And it's all reinforced concrete. It's not even steel, uh, st st steel I beam construction. Where did this come from? Answer, liberalism. And that's the connection between the politics of freedom and the economics of freedom. Liberalism increasingly freed people to have a go, as the English say. First poor men, then slaves, then women. It happened a few times. Um, uh, 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 Catholics, Catholic emancipation in Britain, Jews, Jewish emancipation in lots of countries, um, uh, queers, uh, gender crossers like me, all get freed gradually. And the result was a tremendous encouragement to trying out stuff. And look, I've been alive in the development of the women's movement in the United States and Britain. I've seen it in action. And the generation of my mother, she's 97 now, she's still alive, thank God. Um, she says of my gender change, don't do anything more interesting. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking about it uh, tomorrow. But in her generation, for example, women couldn't have checking accounts independent of men. If you got pregnant, you had to resign your job as a school teacher. Uh, she had a promising career in opera, and her husband, my father, in those days that was conventional. Um, uh, um, stopped her career. Then in my, my sister's generation, that became not how we did things. Women were to that degree liberated. And so it's gone. And the result is masses of women. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, bless her heart, had careers, had freedom, could have a go. And the result is enormous creativity. So that's my connection. And it's, this isn't just a kind of vague speculation. You can find out if it's true. This is a, this is a testable scientific hypothesis, to express it that way. And we can go to the facts and try to understand them. So my, 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 that's, that's the claim in the three stout volumes that lie behind this book, three books of economic and historical science, amounting to 700, I mean, uh, 1,700 pages. And this book is the political book corresponding to the three big volumes behind it. And it says that we shouldn't have socialism. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't try socialism again. We should, certainly shouldn't have fascism. We should have liberalism, a free economy, a free society in which everyone is equal. Thank you. I'll, I'll, we we uh, have time, yeah. I'll, I'll stand up as long as I can, but I'm an old lady, and despite the uh, hips, now my knees are going. So, you know, <laughs> what can you do? We will. Uh, oh, by the way, I need to thank the young people in this room, because as an old person, I'm on Medicare. 
Thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Socialized medicine, anyone? And in, in keeping with that, our, we'll stay with our tradition of starting first with questions from students uh, before Excellent. turning to um, those who are no longer students. Uh, We're so all we, students in but, a sense, but let's... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, the students from my class are here, so uh, okay. they, they get some, some of them and others get first okay. dibs. So you've had your hand up. so I'll, And I, I only have one mic here now, so I will be trucking around the room. Yeah, uh, go ahead, to, uh, bring. I'm curious what your elevator pitch is to the average democratic socialist, and I'm curious if you're an anarcho-capitalist. Well, I'm not an anarcho-capitalist, uh, um, although I have friends who are. Um, I, the elevator pitch is this. Dears, I always call them dears, because they are dear to me, these people. These are my former comrades in arms. And I have lots of friends who are still socialists and so on. I say, would you like to have government planning, industrial policy, so to speak, of the language, the English language? Would you like government planning of rock music? Would you like regulation of painting <laughs> or movies? actually had it for a while, and now it's gone. Would you like that? And I say, well, of course not. Would you like there to be government publication of books and only government publication of books? I say, no, that'd be horrid. It'd be like the old Soviet Union or Maoist China. Uh, then why do you talk completely differently about the economy. There's a great book that I've just finished, and I'm going to read it again, which I don't normally do, by Grossman, a Soviet novelist. It's called Forever Flowing, and it's an appalling picture of Stalinist and then post-Stalinist um, um, communism. And he says at one point, I wish I, I have the translation in my Kindle, I mean the uh, passage in my Kindle, I had to read it. But he says, I used to think, he was an intellectual, he was a famous Soviet novelist. And then he shifted and became a little liberal. He was a communist originally. He said, I used to think that liberty was about freedom of the press, uh, freedom to think philosophically about this, that, and the other, and talk about it, or freedom for artists. But I've realized for most people, it's the freedom to make shoes and sell them. It's the freedom to till your own soil and eat or sell the produce of that that for most, most people are not intellectuals. For them, their freedom is about the economy. So my attitude, I was down in, in Brazil last week, and they said, well, what about it? This uh, Bolsonaro has got, is uh, working on freedom in the economy, but he's a homophobe, and he's a nationalist, and so on and so forth. And I said, look, liberty is liberty is, li is li liberty. You're not a non-slave because you're only a slave on Monday. To be a free person, you must be free every day of the week in all the parts. Now, that doesn't mean you can go around hurting people. Or need, I'm not, as I said, I'm not an anarcho-capitalist. I don't believe in, I believe there should be a government. But it should be smaller, smaller and mainly focused on assuring on assuring that you're free of human coercion. I can't fly. I can fly on an airplane, but I can't, you know, I can try, but it's, I, can, I can't seem to ever get lift off. So there's, there are constraints on me uh, of a physical character. 
right? And I'm not a multimillionaire, so I can't buy a university degree such as Donald Trump bought. I can't, I, I can't, I'm not, I'm not rich, but I'm not subject to, massively subject, as under the Soviet Union, to the coercion by other humans. Sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah, go ahead, dear. Is this working? Sweet. Uh, first, thanks for coming. Um, you honestly might have answered this in this last answer to his question, but it was more of a clarifying point. What is your operating definition of socialism? Because I think the word kind of like liberalism has been skewed to mean several things. You have democratic socialists, social yeah, democrats. Yeah. Look, and then if I, I can uh, right. kind of tax me onto it, what is your view of welfare in a state, like a social safety net, as that relates to I'm in, the liberal economy? I'm in favor of a social safety net. I think you and I ought to be taxed to help the poorest of the poor and the handicapped and so forth. I call myself a Christian, uh, a liberal, but it could be Muslim or Hindu or Jewish or whatever you want. I acknowledge an obligation to the poor, but the, but the best way of helping the poor is to allow them to have f freedom to work. I'm the only person in this room, I take it, who could become an apprentice electrician in the state of Michigan. Any other, any other Michiganders here have a grandfather, an uncle, and a cousin who are in the electrician's union or were in the state of Michigan? If you're not, sorry, you can't be an apprentice electrician no matter how much you want it. Fortunately, I don't want it, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's the truth. And that's coercion by other human beings. Now, what's socialism? Socialism is the society deciding how you ought to behave. That's what socialism is. The society deciding what jobs you're allowed to have. The society deciding whether um, solar panels, sh whether you should be allowed to purchase solar panels from China at half the price that Trump imposed on us. So, so socialism is just as it says. Now, in a family, it works perfectly well. The mom and the dad are endowed with coercive powers over their, their children, as they bloody well should be. If your three-year-old is about to run in front of a truck, you grab him. You don't say, now, dear, now wait. I know you're a free person, but <laughs> consider the argument that it's not a good idea to run in front of a truck. No, you just grab him. That's perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly uh, appropriate. But that's what socialism is. It doesn't have to be Maoist or Soviet central planning. And what I want to do, and what I think most of you would in the end, if I had, uh, you know, we're going to lock the doors and bring in food and stay here for 20 hours, and I'm going to convert all of you to Christian uh, Episcopalian liberalism. Uh, so, so Coercive. That, no, no, it's not. Well, yeah, the locking the doors would be. <laughs> but we'll make an exception for me. And that's the problem. If no. you make an exception for moi, then you're in a, in a situation in which I'm coercing you, and that's socialism. Another question. Thank you for coming here. You were talked a bit about research universities here. And yeah. so I want to ask, because I agree with the premise that ideas drive the economy, yeah. but you can't come up, an individual can't come up with a good idea unless they have a working brain. So sure. how, how do we, how do you think we get people educated? Like, do you want lower costs for education, free education, or? I, I, I want poor people to get subsidized. I don't want people to be subsidized for the, the color of their skin 
or, you know, their gender or something. I want poor people to be better off, and I want it to be cheaper for them to go to college, more yeah. or less, period. Um, I, I, uh, I've been employed for many years by state universities, University of Iowa, Go Hawks, the University of Illinois, Chicago, Go Flames, um, uh, and that's, that's fine, and there are state universities. So the general public is subsidizing the education of kids who will learn more in their lives because they went to college. In most countries, except Japan and the United States, most universities are public and most of them are completely free. In some countries, Holland for example, people are given a stipend, stipend for, for living, free tuition and a stipend. The plan to abolish or pay off student loans is a massive subsidy to the upper middle class. That's among its problems. That's the first problem. The second problem is, well, there are a bunch of problems. <laughs> Let's not get too far along on that. But it is a subsidy to the upper middle class. Every time it's proposed in France to raise tuition uh, at, at the University of Bordeaux or Paris or whatever, the students riot. Well, it turns out the students are the sons and daughters of doctors and professors and lawyers. What are they rioting for? Where did they get the idea that poor people in France should subsidize uh, rich people? So anyway, the best way for everyone to get educated, as I think everyone should, I'm in the industry, I'm in favor of uh, increasing the demand for it, is to get rich. There is an education excuse, which I see particularly vividly in a country I know well and have taught in South Africa, which is that we don't need to um, reduce the obstacles to employment in South Africa we need, to increase, we need to educate people more so that they're worth the high cost of employing someone in South Africa. And that's exactly the opposite of what should be done. They should free the labor market in South Africa as they did in China and India with dramatically good results. Yeah, so thank you for your talk, Dr. McCloskey. But I, I just want to inquire your thoughts on states which have engaged in, which have been economically liberal and extremely innovative, yet have been comparatively conservative in giving out political and social liberties. You mentioned, of course, the first research university was in Prussia, yeah, you which bet. is naturally an ultra conservative state. The Imperial right. German Empire, very innovative, yet yep. very conservative. Even China today is a similar example of comparative economic innovation as well as pro immense uh, growth but yet still very little in the way of social or political freedom so your thoughts well, on that i i i am appalled by the uh, authoritarianism of the communist party in, in china I've, I've been there a number of times i'm going to send my library of eight thousand books um to a chinese university this summer um but let's get straight there's no such thing as the china model You'll hear this in the press all the time, that there's the Chinese model, namely that, that tyranny is good for you. No, it's not. That's not what happened in China. What happened in China is the parts that grew and made Chinese much better off, now equal to, to Brazil, for example, are the free parts. The parts that are still state enterprises or the unfortunate and on economical projects of the central government, such as the, uh, um, what's it called, the, um, the, this idea to build a, a railway across Central Asia, those make Chinese income per head lower. It's only because they've really let people build buildings where they want, start, um, uh, uh, start uh, um, j jobs where they want, that, that they've been able to grow. Um, there's no, alas, there's no automatic connection between, as my friend and colleague Milton Friedman argued once, I'm afraid 
Milton was wrong. There's no obvious immediate ca causal connection between getting rich and getting free. I, I think in the long run it'll work. It worked in South Korea. It worked in um, um, uh, it worked in Taiwan. Um, but in a, and in a way it worked in, in my ancestors' uh, country, uh, Ireland as well. When Ireland became rich, it threw off the domination of the church. When I first went to Ireland in 1967, it was very poor. It was a third world country, and it was uh, it, it, it was priest ridden um, and and coerced by priests and nuns. Um, the rich people don't put up with this. My long-term hope for China is that it will move to political freedom as well. As well, under Xi Jinping, though, it's moving in the other direction rather rapidly. But I think what will happen with him is that the economy is slowing down and will continue to slow down because he keeps edging back towards Maoism. He, by the way, is a shockingly ignorant man, something we've had some experience with in the United States now. He's, um, he has an eighth grade education, Xi Jinping. I mean, I'm sure it's for honorable reasons. He didn't stop school because he, you know, disdained um, intelligence, but, he, but he's not a sophisticated man, powerful though he is. Go ahead, fire away. Okay, thanks. Well, I can assure you that here are a few people from South America, and South America is very famous for having a lot of subsidies for a lot of stuff, gas, education, uh, for example, first need, uh, things like water or light services. So which is your perspective about like how to control the subsidies? Because we have known that along the process, a lot of the money that is supposed to be handed for, for those subsidies just get lost in the process and you end up feeding bureaucracy yeah, and right. also getting people like to get things free in, in instead of incentive them to get yeah. their own stuff yeah, that's the trouble. so which will be like because for example Friedman has these vouchers uh, in order for people to get like more uh, education and so oh, they yeah. can exchange them but the things that in South America we don't have like that kind of custom so which will be like your proposal about like the measure that we should be taking off in order well, to provide them education at, I, at least for kids I I just said what I said which is that a, a liberal economy I was making this argument in in Brazil for a week will give people the wherewithal to have more education and better health care and, and, and so forth. But it is perfectly true that in Latin America there is a populist tradition. Let's take Argentina. It goes back to Juan, Juan, Juan Perón and Evita. And it is that we can live on each other's subsidies. And ta we, we, or to put it the other way, we can live on each other's taxes. We tax Mr. Jones to give money to Ms. Smith, and then we tax Ms. Smith to give money to Mr. Jones or protection. And of course, we're both better off. It's a childish idea, but it's very attractive and very easy to get people excited about. The current democratic field are all tr trying to make these promises. And it's not a race to the bottom, it's a race to the top. It's more and more unrealistic. Uh, someone calculated that um, Bernie Sanders' proposals would amount in, a, in an economy that earns about $22 trillion a year, would amount to $100 trillion. Now, $100 trillion is to increase over, even over 10 years, is to increase, is radically increase the role of the government in the economy, to make it 
instead of 35%, which it is now. 35% is already too big. So for my dear friends in Latin America, I urge them to get an understanding of liberalism. And as I told you, the kind of quick way is to say, why do you want coercion to be the rule in the economy and freedom to be the rule in the arts? What's this all about? What's up? Who's next? Uh, so you said for the education, there should be subsidy for the poor people. Yeah, for poor people. Uh, so, and it, Actually, it, the best form of subsidy for poor people is uh, is uh, what's called the in in Brazil the the the, the bolsa familia or a or or a minimum income that's the best but anyway because then they can spend it on education if they want and initially you were saying that the state should only be involved in control like protecting the uh, citizens from the coercion yes. Uh, but my my understanding this is like if you allow the state to in get involved into the education, like it will grow eventually. Yeah, I understand and that. There will be like no limit. Like you cannot keep it small. Well, but one the, day they will come. Yeah, yeah. But there there's a crucial point here. I'm not in favor of public education. Now I told you I've been employed by big public universities, so you know I'm in a, in a somewhat strange strange p p position here. But I, I would certainly let's let's take I, I'm in favor of subs let's take a clear case. I think everyone in the room thinks that people like us, for the most part, should be taxed to pay for elementary education at least for poor people, and if you want for everybody. But that doesn't mean it has to be supplied by the government. That doesn't mean it needs to, the, the teachers need to be government employees. You can have private schools. We had them in the United States um, in, in the 19th century. And indeed, the United States was, with the exception of, 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 of Prussia, actually, the best educated country in the world in the 19th, 19th century. And it wasn't because of massive state um, intervention. So I, I, I want there to be, um, I want help for the poor. I want, I want, I, I, I want the wretched of the earth to be, to, to, to be better off. And the way that's happening is economic growth. It's not happening with redistribution or Subsidies, look, income per head in the world is growing at about 2% per year um, per person. Uh, contrary to Malthusian ideas, 1 billion people in 1800, nearly 7.5 billion now, income per head, in fact, in the world has gone up by a factor of at least 10, and in places that have adopted innovism full bore, it's gone up by a factor of 30 or 100, as I told you. 2% a year doesn't sound like much. But in a century, it results in a doubling every 36 years. And so in a century, a doubling, a quadrupling, we want to know what we call it, an adium, <laughs> a factor of eight. At a, the average per capita income in the world now is about the same as, as in, in, in Brazil, and China has equaled it. So it's about $33 a day. Um, American income per head is $130 a day. Eight times 33 Let's see. Eight times 33 is way above present American national income. Double American present national income. That's the prospect in a century. 
In a century, the whole world will be developed and rich. And that's my, that's, it's not a dream, it's a reality. If we don't screw it up, if we don't shoot ourselves in the foot as we did in August 1914, for example, take careful aim and <coughs> blam, uh, we'll achieve that. There's no reason we can't. Hey, more question. Um, this has to be a good so one, dear. It's the last no, one. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, to your to your point of which I think everyone would agree, um, providing opportunities for poor people to be able to pursue, Absolutely. you know, aspirations. What are your thoughts on structural inequality in countries um, that could restrict access to those opportunities? Not, inequality isn't the problem. Mm -hmm. Poverty is. Right, but I mean, for Indi for example, in India, um, there's a huge caste divide. Of so course there is. If, but um, so I could have more access to a particular opportunity than someone from a lower but caste it, would. But it turns out that caste, as you know in India, hasn't prevented economic growth. When I was your age, we were all told India's hopeless. You know, they're mostly Hindus, or some of them are Muslims. You can see it must be hopeless. They have a caste system. How are they ever going to grow? Now India is growing per capita faster than China is. And it, we all thought that caste made it hopeless. You're untouchables or, or in, in, in various castes. I mean, Modi, for example, is not a, is not a Brahmin. I thought, well, I don't know. Well, how is that going to work out? It works out that if you're allowed to do stuff, you do it. And India, I don't need to tell you, is a fantastically, by the way, I own two saris. I hope you're proud of me. Two saris. I'm so thrilled, two. Most Indian women of my age own about a hundred, because all it is is a long piece of cloth. But, but um, it's the, letting people free does it. Look, the problems are not the environment, although I'm, I'm not a denier. I, I believe that uh, it's carbon fuel that's causing higher temperatures, and that's bad, and we've got to do something about it. But the big problems are not inequality or uh, the environment or whatever else our friends on the left come up with as a substitute for um, immiserization, which didn't happen, OK? It's tyranny and poverty, and they're connected. Tyrannies aren't <laughs> the wave of the future. It's not a good idea to have central planning from, from, from Washington or from, or, from, or from Delhi. When countries like China or India stop trying to do that, and China stopped. Don't get that wrong. They started to grow like mad. Like mad, I mean, not this 2% a year, which is good enough to cause a eight factor of eight increase in a century, but 10% a year, which doubles income per head in about seven years. Two generations like that, and you're equaling the United States in national income. Income per head in China, if they don't screw it up, and she is trying to screw it up, if they don't screw it up, will be equal to the United States in one long generation. In India, I reckon it'll take two, say half a century. So be of good cheer, dears. Don't let people tell you that the sky is falling or that um, uh, we're, we're all doomed. We're not all doomed. If we let each other free, free in sexual in uh, affectional preferences, free in, and look, <laughs> drug prices. Let me just leave you with this, drug prices. Last night, President Trump said he, he had a program to fix drug prices. It's funny. The proposal by the Dems to fix drug prices is sitting on McConnell's desk, unacted on, but still. He said, oh, yeah, 
I will drug prices. I'm going to take care of it. We could take care of it tomorrow by allowing Americans to buy drugs in Canada. Simple as that. Poof. Drug prices would fall to a third or a tenth, depending on what the drug is, what they are now. Leave people alone. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here, and uh, have a good evening.